Doing epidural blood pressures for um, essentially for headache, uh, but I'll go into it in a bit more detail in a moment about uh, headache for uh, patients with spontaneous uh, intracranial hypotension. It, this talk, I guess, is mainly um, aimed at the um, Queen's emergency practitioners, but I, I guess it could be any of us really, and I guess particularly at, at the Leeds. But um, Queen's Queen's emergency board is is mainly where we, we where we're going to get the request, but of course it, it can fall to anyone. So. Um, what we're talking about is the the onset of a spontaneous orthostatic um, headache due to spontaneous intracranial hypotension. Um, and it's broadly due to th three non-traumatic causes, which I'll chat about in, uh, in in a moment. This is not a didactic academic talk, by the way. This is just to get the ball rolling because uh, it does cause some headaches for the uh, emergency services and. Um, Take from there, um, and it's it's quite different to the headaches that we're familiar with, um, which has got a traumatic cause, which is a a needle in the back of some of some sorts. But of course, when when there's an LP or a dural tap, we we know where the problem lies. Um, uh, so performing the a, a blood patch makes more uh, intuitive sense. But of course, when you have spontaneous onset, uh, it's not quite as intuitive. So there there are three broad broad causes. And number one is these patients have problems with their um, spine, so they might have a, a bony spicule or a disc that's, pl uh, disc that's playing up or something like that. So a problem in the spine. Um, number two, it can be um, a fistula between the CSF and, and the vein. Uh, number three, it can be um, just spontaneously occurring uh, fenestrations um, along the patient's, uh, along the course of the, the patient's um, spine. Um, and then, of course, the, the whole bunch of idiopathic causes. But what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that these are uh, non-traumatic causes, um, and and the problem doesn't really doesn't really go away. And what patients, the main thing that they present with is a very very uh, disabling headache. Uh, and as we all know, uh, with possible severe and sometimes even lethal uh, intracranial um, sequelae. So the incidence. The reason I put this slide up is it's about about four or so. Um, people per 100,000 per year. So on the, on the back of a paper napkin, that's approximately 12 plus for the Nottinghamish area. So we, we're going to get them. There's not millions of them, but they are going to come. They are going to come through. They actually occur most commonly in uh, in middle aged females with about a it's about three to one preponderance. Uh, so a lady I did recently, for example, was in her mid 40s, uh, had two teenage daughters um, and was running her own business and running it from her hospital bed using her iPad. Um, and was unable to stand up straight for any particular length of time. Uh, and when I approached her, I said, would you, would you like a blood patch? Um, you know, this may help and has got some side effects. Basically, her answer to that was, where do I sign? So uh, it's in often young or middle aged people. So often it's you know people with kids, jobs, etc. And the majority of patients do actually respond initially to, or, or do respond to a non targeted epidural blood patch. And I'll chat about this in a bit more detail. So about there's, there's good, good evidence that about now, two thirds of patients uh, will respond to a non-targeted uh, epidural blood patch, which is clearly the, different to the ones that, or the rationale that we would use if you have a, um, a hole in your, uh, hole in your subarachnoid space from a, a lumbar puncture or a dural tap. This is different. Okay, so the features, it's of course a whole bunch of neurological features, but the one that stands out is the headache, really. So it's um, a headache with an interesting uh, assortment of extra features. So this is stuff that we all have some um, knowledge of regarding um, the inter intracranial stuff, so ringing in the ears, um, fuzziness, uh, loss of concentrating ability, eye symptoms. Um, this, is all, all F this is all FRCA stuff, but the headache is is this the standout one. Um, so when you look at the headache, the big thing about it is it's of course it's a headache on on um, standing up. So uh, in some guidelines, which I'll which I'll mention a bit later on, um, it's a headache that is absent or very very mild uh, within two hours of waking or becoming upright. It then starts within two hours of becoming upright, and then after lying flat, uh, there's a more there's a more than fifty percent improvement. And these timings are consistent. So this this will happen. On a daily basis uh, for this patient, because of course get, getting the diagnosis is is really important, the correct diagnosis. The first line investigations, uh, other than the history and examination for these patients, is a contrast enhanced MRI scan of their brain and their spine. Um, 
and it will show features consistent of intracranial hypertension in about 80% of cases, but a normal MRI head does not uh, totally exclude um, SIH. Um, also, interestingly enough, the um, cause of the leak is almost always not shown or is very rarely shown. So where do we come in? Well, we'll get um, approached to do a, an epidural blood patch. So, so these are patients who have presented to neurology um, and if the guideline states, if no, if no improvement within more than two weeks, uh, most, most of these patients are not going to get better. So that's why a, a non-targeted epidural blood patch um, should be offered. Um, and one of the key things to take away is it's a higher volume than we're, that we're, what we're used to. So if we're doing it, let's say, post uh, lumbar dural, dural tap, we'll be using, let's say, 15-ish, 20-ish mils. These are higher volume, so they're more towards the 30-ish, 30-plus kind of mils. Uh, I did a, the lady I did um, uh, a few months ago, I used about 28, 29 mils. Um, and she hasn't presented back, so hopefully she's got better. Uh, but it's a high volume injection. Reason being is if you use the sort of 15 to 20 mils, um, you get about 66% success rate. If you use higher volumes, you get up to 70, 77 plus percent. So the higher volumes make a, a positive difference. The guidelines also state um, if there is no response or a transient response, a second epidural blood patch should be considered uh, within two to four weeks. Again, this should be a group discussion with the patient and with neurologists and neuroradiology. And they also say with the option of using um, fluoroscopy. So again, th this is interesting. So um, th the lady I did a, a few a few months ago, you could pretty much see her epidural space. Um, sh she was really uh, a lovely anatomy. So the epidural plopped in, but this is not the case uh, often in, in, in a good number of our patients. So consider maybe the option of using fluoroscopy to make sure that you're in the right place. Um, I think particularly for this group of patients, getting the injection in the right place is exceptionally important so that you don't get a false negative. And also you don't want to be lumping a large amount of blood outside of the target area, just basically just in, in the soft tissue. And then patients have up to 24 hours of bed rest, bed rest afterwards with, with close observations, and then they can go home. Complications would be a question that we'd be worried about. So the most common complication realistically is, is backache. Maybe even up to 80% of, of people will get some transient backache. But I guess if you had a needle and some blood in your back, it's not surprising. But this almost always goes away. The rest of the complications, so radiculopathies, infections, etc., very, very rare. So going forwards, that's why I presented this was just to get the the views of the department really. Um, you know who would be uh, up for helping with this. Um, which uh, group of anaesthetists would be well placed? I mean, typically the obstetric anaesthetists would would historically be well placed. The pain pain practicing anaesthetists would be well placed. But I guess any any emergency anaesthetist could well be uh, questioned to or asked to 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 do this. So if, if if there is hopefully a positive groundswell, um, I could take it further. I could set up some guidelines, get some consent forms looked at, and some information uh, information leaflets for patients. Um, so yeah, that's where I'm at today. I do have some references. So the, the top one uh, is very recent, um, and it's in the um, Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry, uh, and this was put forward by um, the Queen Square uh, Working Group. It's it's an excellent piece of work. It uses local knowledge, international knowledge. Um, they've also spoken to obviously anaesthetists, neuroradiologists, and also importantly to patients. So it's it's a very comprehensive um, set of guidelines. And then the second one from JAMA Neurology is also a very recent meta-analysis uh, and also very worth a read. Um, and then there's some other ones which you, you can pick up on, on, on the above mentioned publications regarding complications, which I said are very, very, very low to be fair. Uh, Thank you, folks. So that's mainly what I had to say. So are there any questions? Um, open for discussion, please.